And now, with so many interventions and, and so interesting, we have the, the tough job for the summarize uh, with M Michael Stodinger for his permanent representative of Austria at WMO. And then you have the, the, the floor. Thank you very much. What I've heard was extremely interesting, but I wouldn't say contradicting, partly, but also there were very different aspects being shown from the, the spectrum of what's necessary. And one of the uh, elements which shows diverging aspects is short-term versus long-term. We've heard from Albert uh, the low-hanging fruits. And this is, a, this is a term that's often heard, and this is, of course, the first thing you go at. But if you don't have the long shot as well, then all these funds these which are going to be invested in the future, which are necessary to please to close the capacity gap, they're lost. And I think we've seen, all of us have seen sufficient number of projects where money was invested and didn't work out in the long run. That's why uh, what Vladimir said at the very beginning, to use the existing funds efficiently and to go away from infrastructure investment alone towards services and take services as one of the most important criteria, uh, efficient services in the long run for yeah. investments and have these sustainably, then also funded long-term grants from the government. I think that's an extremely important element. Uh, what also I think is very important is this user orientation. And it really needs a paradigm shift in the med services for everybody involved that uh, at the very beginning we had the question uh, from indigenous knowledge to uh, digital knowledge. Uh, and it looks like if these are two completely contrary positions, they don't have necessarily to be. Because if you want to reach people, you can only reach them if you touch the knowledge which people have. And this is in many countries, in many situations, it's indigenous knowledge. It also has very much to do with the gender question, because uh, uh, women not being included also in the dissemination part, of, but also in the way to understand problems, in the way to act on critical situations. If you leave out that, then you leave out the most important part. So I think to have this paradigm shift, which was said several times now, uh, to be in a new form, user-oriented, when you disseminate warnings, when you disseminate forecasts, when you talk about long-range forecasts, as we heard for the South Zone, where very important decisions have to be taken, not by the decision makers in high up in the politics, no, but also by people on the ground, no, whether they use the, the corn for, for the, the season here, for the seeds, or for just for consumption right away. So th if you don't uh, think along the value chain and reach the people where they have to make their decisions and where they have to use their own knowledge, then you'd be lost. At the very end, training was mentioned several times. And training uh, in a way from the global campus, which is one way to do. But again here to see the full value chain, how to reach people and how to include all of them the society being really inclusive, I think this might be the key to success. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you to all of our speakers so far. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to move on to theme five as quickly as possible. So we're going to just dive right in. Um, and uh, uh, Tomas is going to invite our first speaker. Mm -hmm. Just keep in mind the, the, the elevator pitch thing, you remember? Huh? Um, let's go for the first one, who's Brian Day, chairman of HMEI. Uh, you have been actively involved in various dialogues during the, the last year, and you what would, would your response and your emphasis on this theme on role, responsibilities, partnerships, and common actions? Mm -hmm. Do I see you? <laughs> so could you repeat the question? Because I didn't um, quite catch it. I'm it's sorry, not the same as what I, I read I mean, this I heard you have been involved in various dialogues during the last year, and, and you put in your response uh, in, the, in the previous uh, survey the emphasis in the needed cultural change, and you, did, you said that us versus uh, them, you know? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good lesson to be learned. Always be careful what you write because it will come back to bite you someday. <laughs> I didn't create that statement. It came out of five years of discussions and it was something that was brought up in Washington DC in 2017 that the World Bank uh, ran a forum on public-private partnerships and some of the problems. And this us versus them theme came out. And I would 
like to characterize that a little differently by going back and looking at, we have data, if you write down the, uh, the themes for this meeting, data, forecast, services, capacity gap, and partnership. Every time we talk about the first four, we are constantly talking about partnership. And partnership, when we talk about the cultural aspect, yes, we have a culture problem within our group. We are a collection of scientists and engineers. Our very nature and our very training tells us to question everything. And that's how we grew this industry. But when we question each other's motives, that's when what makes us strong makes us weak. I think Dr. Ussolini said it best yesterday, the pie is very big. That we need to look at how we complement and enhance each other. And so when we come to partnerships, I think we need to look at it. When you enter into a partnership, you are not looking at your needs. You are looking at the needs of your partner. And your partner, you have to trust, is looking at your needs. If you are looking at your own needs and your partner is looking at their needs only, that's a negotiation. And that doesn't foster good solutions. And so when we look at partnerships, we have an opportunity if we articulate what the big vision is of the problem we are trying to solve, we can create good partnerships. So yes, we have a culture problem, but I don't say that it's us versus them. I think that's a symptom of trust. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Day. Next up, I would like to invite Andrew Johnson to speak, uh, PR of Australia uh, with WMO. Um, you stressed the need for open, constructive, and respectful dialogue uh, where everyone has a chance to speak. Uh, do you have an example from uh, your own experience to share where that worked? No. <laughs> <laughs> OK, moving along then. <laughs> no, just kidding. Is everybody awake? Good afternoon. Um, thanks for the question. I don't actually recall writing that down, but it sounds very prophetic. Um, I think maybe how I would answer the question uh, is that, uh, and I must say at the, the beginning I'm a newcomer to this community. I've only worked in this community for three years, but I've worked uh, across many, many different sectors for over 30 years, and so maybe a couple of my comments will reflect that, that experience. I actually think in, in Australia there are very few examples of truly outstanding, meaningful and enduring partnership between uh, the public uh, sector, the private sector, academia and the community uh, in, in partnership in the areas we're interested in. But as I said before, in other sectors, I think there are plenty of examples, and this will be one of the key points I'd like to make, is that I, I don't think the sector reaches out enough and draws upon the lessons that, uh, that we could from other sectors. There are four things I'd like to say, just because time's short, if that's okay, that are learnings that I've taken from, from that 30 years of um, of experience where I have been involved and privileged to be involved in some truly outstanding and, and transformational partnerships across the sectors. Uh, the first is that uh, initiating and sustaining partnership is a serious professional undertaking in its own right. Uh, really great partnerships are hard work. It cannot be uh, ad hoc. Um, common sense and goodwill are necessary but not sufficient. Um, and it requires just as much rigour and discipline in my experience is that uh, as many of us as scientists bring to our scientific undertakings uh, to the process of partnership, and uh, often we forget that. We think it's just common sense, and it's not. The second is that uh, great partnership requires uh, sustained investment and commitment over a long period of time. And, and often, uh, many of us find that difficult and are not prepared to accept those terms at the beginning when we enter into discussion with our partners. The third uh, thing I'd like to say is that uh, it requires those of us who are involved, and this point has been made before by others, to really focus on where each of us has a unique and differentiated offering, being really clear about where we can uh, add value to one another's activities and being really clear about where our responsibilities lie. And it may also mean, uh, particularly for those of us uh, who live in the public sector, to adjust our risk appetites and to embrace uh, a higher tolerance for ambiguity uh, than, um, than uh, many of us are used to. And this is tough for a community that's traditionally obsessed by notions of precision and accuracy and perfection. 
Lastly, I'd like to say, I think, and I think this is the most important I'd, uh, point I'd like to make, I think for those of us particularly, particularly in the public sector, but across all the actors, I think it fundamentally requires us to uh, reflect deeply on what success looks like. You know, why are we here? Um, how, is, uh, how is our success measured and how is it recognised? And I think when you, when you go into those fundamental issues, that's, that's where true transformational partnership occurs because at the end of the day when you're not concerned about who gets the credit it's amazing what can get done. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. The next speaker will be Maxim Yakovenko, uh, permanent representative of Russian Federation at WMO. Uh, you raised an interesting point on the survey uh, about the need to, to set uh, of behavior scenarios of the general public on business which can be connected to the need to, to make link with social science. Can you please elaborate the, the idea and how you do it in your country? Thank you. As a matter of fact, we're talking about growing uh, the month pie. We haven't started eating it yet. So before we do that, the eating part, I would like to dwell upon two aspects. One is a matter of fact what we're using to get our pie ready. The most difficult uh, issue in interaction between uh, NHMSs is uh, a question of access uh, to observational data. If you want, uh, it's a kind of natural resource. Any resource uh, has an owner, and any resource has a price. Uh, what determines the price uh, is uh, the cost in order to get the resource. So when we start eating our pie, we should decide for ourselves uh, in terms of uh, recommendation of or a rule set uh, so that the private sector could take into consideration to account the cost part of national uh, meter services uh, they had to incur in terms uh, of observation, of transfer, processing data, you name it. This is extremely important nowadays. Again, the pie gets bigger, the price for the pie uh, gets higher. So we all know that uh, national governments uh, do not finance 100% uh, the production of the pie I'm referring to. So we do need uh, very well-determined uh, game rules in terms of interaction between uh, public service, uh, meta services, and the private sector. I could use an example which uh, works very well. It's a product uh, sharing agreement. It works uh, in every sector where natural resources are extracted and produced. In this particular case, both uh, public sector and private sector are quite happy. Second aspect, uh, responsibility for the forecasting job. Be it private sector or public sector, we all produce a product. So as a matter of fact, the quality of the product or the pie which is uh, baked uh, by uh, the national meta services is better, yummier than what is produced as a pie by uh, private sector. But uh, the user at large doesn't understand who actually has baked this pie. The user tends uh, to uh, confuse uh, and uh, to understand who is behind, be it private sector or public sector. Because both uh, players have meteorologists uh, and forecasters. Moreover, quite often the user doesn't understand 100% how to use the forecast uh, they are receiving. So I think that it would be mostly useful for us 
for the user to understand what was used to bake our pie, for one, how you can eat it in the right fashion. When it comes to uh, uh, severe weather events, that's where it is extremely important. So I would call it uh, a quasi-catalog uh, to be used by the consumer or user so that they could understand what a forecast uh, means in this particular case, what decisions uh, they should take uh, based on the type of information they received. At least uh, this kind of, of information and uh, issues are extremely important for a huge matter service as the one uh, in Russia. We are working on the surface of 17.17 million square kilometers. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Abdallah Moxit, the head of uh, IPCC Secretariat, to uh, speak on the role of climate science. Uh, it's going to be even more important in the future, of course. Uh, can the IPCC be a role model, though, in the collaboration and partnership? Thank you very much, and uh, I, of course, uh, IPCC can be uh, can play a good role. Uh, but uh, also already to demonstrate this, I've, uh, we, we can already start that uh, IPCC in uh, fifth cycle already introduced partnership. We can just look for seven headlines for one chapter in uh, fifth cycle. We have already two related to, to partnership. Now also for the sixth cycle itself. The sixth cycle will reflect on new degree of interdisciplinarity. This effort will integrate the different domains of climate knowledge and bring them together focus, focusing on solution. Solution. To, uh, to implement solution, we need science. We need science, we need good science we need good communication, we, go, we need good demonstration of the benefits, and we need a good demonstration implementation. And we can imagine a king or prime minister or minister, they are interested just for small messages, a kind of key messages you can put in back of one visit card. That say, for example, from special report 1.5, I will use the second key message, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C is not impossible, but require unprecedented transition in all aspects of society. This is the one key message from four. What it means? We need a good science, of course. And IPCC is the body by excellence assisting science. We are not doing science. We are assisting science. The quality of our, of our report is at the level of quality of science. And this is why we should really improve the degree of science. At the limit to say we should manage the science risk. Because without science, we have no information. We, not, without, we, we cannot have any help in decision making. But also I want to highlight something that we are at the time that we should focus on what is expected from us. It's how we can serve well how we can create job, wealth, and also how we can save lives and goods. And this is why it is requested that we can provide and introduce a new concept of knowledge risk management rather, rather than crisis management. Why? Because the rhythm of climate change is accelerating. There is no possibility of adaptation with this rhythm. And this is why we should anticipate Knowledge is connected to science. And I think uh, we, we should thank WMO with pro the, providing this input of science. And also, we should really work all together in order to make science as easy as possible. Because at the end, the decision maker just needs a sentence with thousands of pages with scientific volume. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now we have Matthew Alto, Manager for Global Data Partnerships on AccWeather. 
uh, you were very optimistic on your envisage of 2030. Uh, the question is that uh, you, you see you saw a, a, a good relationship in 2030 between all the all the stakeholders. Uh, the question is what part of this vision is it national level or maybe international level, or, and what would what would be the role of WMO in this uh, vision? Yeah, yeah, thank you. And those of you who know me well know that I'm a pretty optimistic person, so probably thus the <laughs> the reasoning behind my response. Um, but basically, basically the basis of my comment that I provided on the survey is that misunderstanding and a lack of trust still exists between the public, private, and academic sectors of the global weather enterprise. And this would need to be alleviated in order to achieve anyone's vision in this room for 2030. Uh, we need to seek to better understand each other and where we can best contribute uh, to the goals and the visions of the global weather enterprise. It takes a whole enterprise uh, to deliver services which strive to accomplish our shared common public service mission of saving lives and helping people prosper. Uh, friends, colleagues in this room, I mean, we need each other in order to be successful and achieve our goals and our, our missions. Uh, we need uh, and as I stated in my comment, uh, clear, well-defined, and mutually agreed upon roles and responsibilities of the public, private, and academic sectors of the global weather enterprise, which maximize uh, all of our strengths. Um, on the national level, I think it's important that government focuses on having the very best foundational weather data, uh, which is readily available and, and, can, and open for use. And, and this is absolutely critical uh, for the entire value chain. Uh, this empowers industry and innovators, uh, and, and not exclusively to the weather enterprise, as Louis pointed out yesterday in his comments. Uh, the exciting things about uh, open data is that you can never imagine uh, the type of great solutions uh, from data mashups and data fusions uh, when innovators get access to foundational weather data. Uh, weather acknowledges no boundaries, and access to foundational weather data should not as well, in my opinion. Um, in, in the world of shrinking budget allocation, which can ultimately have a negative effect on foundational weather data provided by national meteorological and hydrometeorological services, industry and private sector uh, providers can assist by being the spokesperson on the value of the information produced by the government agency, not only nationally but also internationally as well. Um, and this helps justify the need for resource allocation and ultimately assist in ensuring that uh, funding is made available in particular countries. On the, on the international level, I believe that we need to have set up some sort of formal and informal mechanisms like this one here today for government, industry, and academia to plan and work together for the greater good. In regards to a formal uh, mechanism, we need to develop something like the Fair Weather Report, which was developed in the United States and some of you in this room may be familiar with. I want to stress, though, that uh, one model that has worked quite well in the United States uh, may not really apply to other parts of the world, and this needs to be addressed. Um, without a formal uh, mechanism, followed by frequent exercising of the coordination mechanisms, uh, misunderstanding and suboptimization of available resources to provide the best weather information will be the ultimate end result. Um, and I see the WMO leading this effort to develop a formal mechanism which we can all abide by. Um, just a concluding remark here, uh, future uh, technology trends and scientific advancements are creating new opportunities for the global weather enterprise, which has been discussed, uh, to have an increased role in improving the lives of people all over the world and reducing the impact to economies from high impact and dangerous weather and climate events. In order to recognize these opportunities, a renewed focus on partnering in new and innovative ways which take advantages of the unique capabilities of each sector is not only required, uh, but it is absolutely necessary. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Philip Ev Evans to speak, uh, Chief Operating Officer for the UK Met Office. Uh, you uh, mentioned that mistrust between linked but separate sectors, uh, lack of agility, uh, as major obstacles to better cooperation. Uh, do you have any ideas on how those obstacles can be removed, and is there a role for the OCP? <coughs> thank you. Like many in the room, uh, I've had a lot of experience of uh, cross-sectoral partnerships, uh, uh, and the, the one lesson that I've taken from all of those is that it's hard. Uh, even partnerships with like organizations based in one country, it's hard. Uh, I, I can't count the times I've sat there and been exasperated by the inexplicable behavior of the partner. Of course, the problem wasn't the behavior of the partner. The problem was me, because I didn't understand. Uh, and with misunderstanding comes mistrust. 
uh, and I think we neglect how important those things are for successful partnerships. But why does that come about? I, I, other people have touched on it. We're technical people. Uh, we think about science, we think about technology. Uh, I think we neglect the softer elements of partnerships. We, we think about interoperability of systems and data and models. We don't think about interoperability of organizations and people. And I think that's really important and it's very hard. So what can we do? Well, I have four, four points. Um, I think the first one is, is dialogue, a forum in which we can speak to each other, but actually not to speak to each other, a forum in which we can listen to each other, because that's the more important point. I think that, that dialogue is important to a point, and I'll come back to that later. The second thing is um, we all sit, generally, uh, at a particular point in the weather value chain, uh, and we sometimes, without realizing it, think that that's the only way to think about the value chain, the only lens that matters. Well, it isn't. I think we need to be disciplined with ourselves about trying to take a broader perspective of the entire value chain and where other people sit within that. I think we also need to recognize, and this is just human nature, if we sit in a particular area, a particular sector, maybe the public sector, we need to recognize that the chances are the private sector will judge our behavior by the worst example of that behavior, not the best. So we have a responsibility to our particular communities by the way in which we behave and engage. Third point, agility. Um, the, the exercise of uh, judging what the world was gonna be like in 2030 was interesting, but I can guarantee what I said was wrong. Uh, the challenge for us is not the pace of change so much as the unpredictability of change. That puts pressure on individual organizations, let alone partnerships, and we need to configure our relationships to be able to deal with change. And the final point um, it is about doing something. Uh, and uh, that doing something is in part about low-hanging fruit, and that's important, but it is also true that the best way to break down barriers to build trust is a common endeavor. And those common endeavors and success will demonstrate to the rest of the community what can be achieved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Evans. And next speaker will be Miloslav Tamija. And we have in this room, we have big countries like the Russian Federation. We have small countries like Tonga, have big companies like IBM and Biocide, uh, Windy, which is a small company, good, very good looking, I have to say this way. <laughs> uh, Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, what we'll have you say about the obstacles of being small and, and for the startups, maybe? It's not, not easy. So uh, the role uh, of the private sector, whether it's large companies or very small companies like Windy, I think uh, it's very clear that uh, it, what has been mentioned here, what I've been hearing uh, in the last two days, that uh, there is a necessity for change, there is a desire for change. I think without the private sector, the change will be much slower and much more expensive. So uh, if we want to make sure that the change happens in any foreseeable future, we should deepen our uh, cooperation. Uh, the role specifically in one sentence of the private sector is, I think, to catalyze the change. That would be the, the definition. Uh, the obstacles, besides what has been mentioned, yesterday we mentioned that there is a lack of platform, lack of legislation, lack of regulation. What I do want to say, agreeing with some of the sp uh, speakers before me, is that is the kind of mentality of us against them, and uh, until we rid us of this uh, mindset, I don't think any change will be possible, really. So what I want to say to all my colleagues from the public sector, the private sector is not here to uh, steal your jobs or to, uh, I don't know, destroy your work. We complement each other. And I will go even further and say that without the public sector, the private se sector simply couldn't exist. It would be, uh, it would be impossible. And I'm going to give you two specific reasons for uh, further cooperation or deeper cooperation. One of them is, the first one is kind of abstract and uh, uh, sublime, perhaps the, the other one is more materialistic and more measurable, more concrete. The first one, together we can contribute to the co common good of the, of the people, of the end users. We call them end users. Uh, we can uh, you know, uh, deploy information to people in need, to people in distress, to people who need their lives to be saved. We can uh, help businesses make smarter decisions, save money, and thus uh, help the global economy uh, overcome any obstacles. Uh, that uh, we will be facing in the future, whether it's agricultural sector, logistics, aviation, even space industry. The second uh, reason for cooperation, and I think it, it is more tangible, it also has been mentioned by somebody, I don't remember by whom, uh, it's more materialistic, as I said. The public sector uh, is financed by, from the, from the common, uh, common money, common funds, and uh, the, the public sector, and the private sector 
depends on that, depends on that uh, framework, de depends on that information. And the private sector is ready to do anything to encourage the local governments or whoever the bodies are to maintain the financing, to maintain the funding of the public sector because otherwise it's simply not, uh, not going to work. There will be many other reasons, but I want to uh, keep this as short as possible. And uh, last of all, I want to say thank you for inviting me here. And uh, uh, if there's anything that Windy or myself can do to uh, uh, work on these specific goals in the future, we'll do that. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, next, I would like to invite Daisuke Abe, uh, Director and Chief Service Officer of Weather News, to speak. Uh, you wrote about the great potential for a public-private academic engagement to multiply the socioeconomic benefits. Uh, do you see a role for the OCP in that? Yes, thank you. So we Weather News receive a lot of voices and requirements from people and enterprise for reducing weather risks all over the world every day and every day. These needs and expectations from people and enterprise are immeasurable, and those weather risks have not been solved yet. To live up to all those expectations, we need to have customer-driven mind and to have deep domain knowledge in every industry and to optimize limited resources and capitals. These three points are so important. To achieve this, it is indispensable to clarify and recognize the role and responsibility of the public and the private sectors and define these roles and responsibility officially and legally. In Japan, the public-private engagement with the clearly identified roles of JMA and the private sectors have successfully been functioning under the Meteorological Service Act since 1952, and the values of weather services have been extremely increased. As a next step, we strongly expect that OCP through WMO should establish a sound PPP framework that enables, enables the society to best utilize the meteorological services. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Abe. And then we have the ne our last speaker for today. Before the summary, is Roger Polwarty. He is senior scientist in the Physical Science Division at the NOAA Earth System Research Laboratory in, Build in Boulder. Um, this kind of leadership needed. So what makes partnership possible All and right. sustainable? Great. Thank you very much for having me. So as we think about the title of this, this meeting, Intelligence, the information about and coming from places of risk, what makes us intelligent is the use of that information to reduce, manage, and take advantage of the opportunities provided by that information. That's the link. But the most critical thing we see around the world is not simply the physical or the social networks, but the behavioral one. How do people and communities see themselves able to make change? One of the usual things I get when we're in that context is, yeah, let's be proactive, you first. What does that mean? It means there's an upfront cost and a risk. So one of the things we do have to get past as we think about how we do better with what we know, how we can do better with emerging knowledge and products, is to really articulate what was just said by Miloslav. The ability to access and interact with public sector research is an important determinant of the productivity. We know that in this room, that is not broadly articulated. It is why still there's opposition. The links, however, we know can catalyze change but more important than even catalyzing change is that it can provide an architecture for participation. Where have we seen things work? We have a lot of lessons identified, but how many of them are learned? When we look at where, it has le where we have learned good lessons, in the United States we use less water than we did in 1975, even though we doubled our population. It didn't affect the GDP, so some things do work. The focusing events and the windows of opportunities, the existing social basis for collaboration, but the most important thing is when leadership and public are engaged and we can develop a collaborative framework between research and management that is public focused. When we see those together, we've seen successes over time. But what does this mean in the context of how we should act? How do we move from just risk to resilience? You heard David Grimes, Michelle Jarreau talk about broadening the actor network. When has this worked to mobilize social, economic, and political will? It works when we are not just talking about academics and tools, we're not just talking about agencies and private capital, but we are engaging local conveners, the implementers, the transaction brokers, and the mainstreamers who actually help mobilize political will. And I want us to be clear about that part of the thing. We need 
a little bit bigger framing for how we think. They help make the link between capacity building and community-based implementation work. This gets back at alignment, agility, and adaptation. When we do this, we ensure political authority and coherence, and we can help make that happen. We develop a culture of partnership. Partners do not just share data, they share risks and responsibilities. And where leadership helps us is making sure that accountability and, and efficiency are working together. Efficiency by itself is not enough. And the reason why it's not enough is a very classic statement that I hear from the African, uh, it's an African proverb, I've heard it among Native Americans where I work. If you are doing something for me without me, it is against me. And so let us keep this in mind. The Secretary General talked about ethics. This is absolutely important. Ethics are distributive, who gets what? Ethics are coercive. If you do not do or act by the rules, you get retribution. But the most important types of ethics is participation. How are the marginalized, including women, engaged in our process? So I want us to keep that in mind because you heard, and we skipped over it, a very important story from Pauline Dube. She said, in the effort to create the network, I have sacrificed my academic career. This is so important that the policy entrepreneurs that we rely on to build those bridges and make those links to secure global and local knowledge to assemble the coalitions play a risky role and we need to support them. So to finalize, we've talked about the technical in a really insightful way. We've talked about the organizational, the economic, but how do we make learning deliberate and support the links from learning to action? It's only by understanding the ecological, the interaction of people, identity, knowledge, and environmental factors as complex and adaptive in responding to a changing environment. That's how we build our networks. Thank you, Roger. Um, to uh, summarize our final that. theme, I'd like to invite uh, Celeste uh, Salo uh, to speak. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, well, we, we've listened a lot, and thank you for all of you that sh sharing all these uh, interesting um, ideas and concepts. Uh, since I come from uh, meteorology, I will say that uh, partnerships are essentially uh, completely uh, necessary for us. And I was thinking in, in, in uh, replying the idea of data simulation. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, we had people thinking on data, that data was perfect, and on the other hand, we had people uh, working on models and saying that models were perfect. And it wasn't until we went into data simulation, putting the models and observations into the best analysis, we couldn't get uh, the closer approach to the truth. Uh, uh, still, the truth is not uh, there, we cannot find it, but uh, we, we were more, more close. So uh, that's to say that we have to definitely to, to work in partnerships. And uh, I, I, I like to echo most of what I uh, heard uh, before, but I think that uh, the, the main part of partnerships it has to do with my colleague uh, Brian said, is uh, thinking in the need of the other. Uh, building from that and sharing uh, a common endeavor that is uh, the, the common goal of benefiting the society as a whole, I think uh, we will go if, uh, in the right di direction. Um, uh, in this sense, I think that this platform will, will help us a lot because we are, we are seeing that here. We are, uh, I, I think that everyone after yesterday and today has a, a, a new uh, step in their mind, and uh, we have uh, reflected a lot uh, on the role and the ideas, and what is uh, we have ahead a huge, uh, a huge uh, challenge. I, I, I keep some uh, words: share roles, uh, well, have clear roles and responsibilities, share risk and responsibility. We we have to to keep those in mind, and. Uh, well, uh, I think that this common platform is a good way of uh, having a frequent exercising of this discussion. So I, I really uh, happy to, to be part of this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Saulo. And then we can have the applause for us. Mm -hmm. okay. Well done. And just, and now how we move forwards. Uh, we invite uh, 
you know him, <laughs> <laughs> Dimitar Ivanov, who will show us the way for the future. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's easy. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I really um, am so uh, overwhelmed with the, the richness of the of the material we collected through your initial inputs and through this discussion and through what's coming in the in the open channel with the, the emails with the girls working in the back. It's huge, and, but I have only two minutes to share with Secretary General, so it's, I'm in a very <laughs> difficult position at the moment. But let me just show you the, um, some ideas of the way uh, forward. So the, we had a wonderful uh, drafting team on the statement. <laughs> statement is still something in the making. So uh, <coughs> yesterday they worked after the first session and they came to the structure of the statement, which we have now on this, on this slide. When generally expressing the welcome, welcoming the establishment of this new mechanism. And I think this was uh, agreed by everybody who, sp who spoke in, in, in this room. And then what are the main elements of main objectives in these uh, five bullet po points? Uh, the role of WMO as uh, convener and facilitator of the mechanism. And the complementarity, the openness to work with all existing or future pot mechanisms similar where we see people from different sectors, think tanks, and uh, any type of informal or formal groups. And that's why we call it open, and the door was open all the time, so many people were coming and going. So it's, it's an open space. So uh, then way forward. So this is what is the plan for, for, for action, because uh, Petteri from the start said, this is something that will create actions. Otherwise, we, there is no reason to, to spend these three hours in, in these uh, two days. So there is a list of actions planned. There is a very um, much uh, the willingness to create these uh, position papers or white papers, whatever you call it, on the identified five uh, major, major domains where we need to work together. And actually I think uh, all the statements that should go to these uh, white papers were already set in, during these two days. And uh, if we can just order them in the right order and the right context, we'll have wonderful material. So this is very important for informing future decisions. So this uh, statement will be finalized, the group will work uh, during the Congress and to be distributed by Secretary General within a month to, to all participants with uh, invitation to, to join the, the mechanism. And uh, within the next uh, year or so, we plan to have some in consultation with, with, with you to form some work streams or, or, or team, uh, task teams or drafting teams to work on these identified areas uh, for, for position papers, white papers, and material to inform decisions. There is uh, also a clear uh, understanding that this will be a repetitive uh, type of uh, event with um, uh, possibly annual meetings at high level and uh, a lot of other activities in between to prepare these materials. So uh, what is uh, it planned for the time being, uh, more or less firmly, it's still in the Congress process, of course, uh, we, the Global Data uh, Conference in next year and possibly the next uh, OCP high level event in, in June uh, next year uh, within the work program of, uh, of the Executive Council. But I'll stop here. As I said, this is work in progress and you receive uh, all this communication soon. I would like just to invite uh, Petri at this stage to, to say his closing remarks and uh, we have to be on time to get the buses back to, because the president is here and he needs to open the plenary at 3 a.m. Thank you very much. So uh, I would like to thank you all for, for coming here and, uh, and uh, it's clear for all of us that the world is changing and, and, and we have to change with, uh, we have to promote the change and uh, we have to make sure that this change is ha happening in a coordinated and an optimal way. And we should keep the interest of the governments and, uh, and, and the people in the countries in mind uh, while, while running this, uh, this change. 
I think that we have had very good uh, discussions here, and, and I, I'd like to thank you all for, for saying quite openly what, uh, what you think. And uh, it's not uh, it's kind of glossy, uh, nice statements only, but you have said what you really, really think, and I'd like to thank you all for, for that. And, and it's a question whether we are optimistic or pessimistic after hearing your inter interventions. I'm personally optimistic, and, uh, and it's not enough to be optimist, uh, but we have to also deal with concrete uh, action. And that's, uh, that's what's needed, and that, that makes the change that we are uh, planning, to, planning to make. And, and Dimitar already uh, listed three issues. We will repeat this kind of uh, exercise on an annual basis. Uh, uh, we will discuss with the forthcoming WMO president, but uh, my idea is that we would have it attached to the future executive councils and, and the next one takes place in 2020, June. So, so I would like to invite you tentatively to such an event. Then we will have the data conference, as Dimitar said, and, and, and there we would like to see private sector and also science and innovation sectors uh, on board. And uh, that's going to take place early, early next year. And uh, then we would like to start inviting more and more all of those players uh, to our uh, technical commission and uh, our regional association meetings and also uh, our congress in 2021, which is uh, planned to be an extra congress. Uh, I would like to see many of you participating in the, in the event. And then from WMO side, we are also happy to work together with our partners. We have uh, uh, transport-related partners, IKEO, IMO, uh, we have also ITU, which is dealing with uh, artificial intelligence and, uh, and frequencies, for example. And uh, we, have, we have already started interaction with the World Economic Forum, and they are interested in, in promoting this, uh, this uh, cooperation as well. We hope that the Geneva Declaration will be approved uh, during the coming, coming days. And then we have a, a major WMO publication, WMO bulletin, and we would be happy to devote one one issue of the of the bulletin to to this, this uh, private sector uh, science and innovation sector uh, issue. Uh, then I would like to thank many of you who have been contributing to the success of this event and and f further steps. Uh, firstly, uh, me and David uh, agreed uh, that we, sh we should have our executive executive council engaged in this business, and uh, we devoted. Uh, uh, part of our executive council in 2016 to this issue, and uh, some of you were present uh, there as, as well. And uh, we, in 2017, we discussed uh, also the private sector engagement in the aviation business, which is an important uh, sector as well. <coughs> we are also grateful for World Bank. Uh, you have been catalyzing this uh, process very much uh, by uh, inviting us to Washington a couple of years ago when, you, when the global weather enterprise was established. and. Uh, that's still one important think tank for us, and uh, we are most happy to work together with the bank uh, in, in less developed countries and, uh, and, and, and to make, make sure that this private sector engagement is a success, success story. Then we are very happy to, we have been very happy to t work together with HMEI, and, uh, and we would be happy to see that as one of our main interfaces to private sector in the future, and, and that means that uh, that also the service providers, if they are members of HMEI, that might be an optimal, optimal way. There's a need to have a common, common tone from the private sector, and, um, and, and we have difficulties in interacting with the individual private sector actors separately, but it would be fair towards the whole community that we would have a, have a common, common interest interface. And we have a common interest. Uh, we, we, we have to make sure that there's enough public sector financing for the, for the observing infrastructure, and, and, and we will have also open, open data policies more and more in the countries. That's, uh, that's our common, common interest, and if, if there are some private sector-driven uh, observing programs, uh, governments should make sure that uh, there's open, open access to such, such data. So, so that kind of financing has to, has, has to take, uh, take place. And, uh, and we would like to uh, see this uh, cooperation uh, handled in an organized way, and, and in the best, ca best case, we can find win-win approaches. And, and my colleague from NOAA was just stating this, uh, this in, a, in a very nice, uh, nice way. And we need uh, additional financing for, for, uh, for the success of this, uh, this work, and, uh, and uh, 
our rich partners in Washington may help us, and uh, we have also <laughs> one rich partner in, in so South Korea, Green Climate Fund, who, who may also support us in that, uh, that sense. And we should also keep, the, keep in mind the interest of science community. For, the, for these scientific purposes, we need uh, high quality, well-maintained uh, ob observing systems, uh, both meteorological ones and uh, greenhouse gas and, and so forth, and, and, and that's the dimension of uh, IPCC. And finally, I think that we should keep in mind that uh, one size doesn't fit all. And, and that's why we as WMO, we can understand that there are different ways of uh, running this business together and, uh, and, and we are happy to help countries in, in, in finding a suitable model and uh, hopefully a legal basis for the, for, the, for the cooperation. So finally, I would like to thank you all for excellent, uh, excellent event and, uh, and this is uh, not going to be the end of the story. I, I, th I hope that this is going to be the beginning of the story and, uh, and, and finally I would like to thank Dimitar and, uh, and Erika and, and Thomas for, for, for taking care of the practicalities here. Thank you.